It's been a while since I've been in the city. Since my first visit in 2019, the world has thunderously changed in more ways than one. But the sweet prospect of coming back here remained a certainty, as I took a personal oath to revisit, re-experience and re-examine my undiminished love for this place. Vienna, that city of nearly indescribable beauty, one that oozes a kind of wistful, nostalgic grandeur. It took me a while to realize how much I missed being in the city, and being back here is like peeling back a fond memory, revealing a world of visual and sensory details that's truly a world of its own. easy to be particularly biased with Vienna. I mean, anyone who appreciates refinement would feel at home here. Anyone who regards culture as significant would be supplied with such abundance. Anyone who respects history would be immersed in its multi-storied, colourful past. And it's truly good to be back in Vienna. By far, this has remained to be one of my favourite European capitals. I missed walking along its grand boulevards, getting lost in its cobbled streets, soaking up in art and culture, steering into its great palaces and parks, and spending unhurried time in its glorious coffee houses and beautifully ornate museums. I visited four years ago during Christmas time, and I was back recently this past summer to experience Vienna from another season, and thankfully a much warmer one when you can see the city take on another face, another kind of life. And to remind myself that while the world changes at such startling speed, there's a place like Vienna that holds steadfast to its legacy, resolute to its classical core, and breathes the same atmosphere as its distant yet nonetheless nuanced past. I came back here in the summer, and what a rapturous time to be in Vienna. All it took was a brief jaunt around the Innerstadt to be reminded of what a truly stunning place this is. The Innerstadt contains a lot of what you consider Vienna's greatest hits, which one can easily spend a whole day just walking around, going from one place to the next. From Stephansplatz to the palatial complex of the Hofburg, right to the wonderful museum's quartier, admiring the glorious Meretiriesenplatz where two of Vienna's greatest museums face each other as though in a harmonious agreement in a marriage of architectural beauty. Around the corner, there's also Arbatina, with its famous terrace with a good vantage point of the Vienna Staatsoper, with the Viennese State Opera. As much as I enjoyed walking down this memory lane of places I've already been before, I also longed to see parts of Vienna which I haven't caught a glimpse of. And in the summer, Vienna springs into a magnificent blue, with the wealth of gardens and parks that are sublimely free and open to everyone. Just across from the Hofburg is the Burggarten, and it takes only a short walk here and you'll understand that the Viennese adore the parks. I've read that more than half of the city of Vienna is green, despite its urban spread. A stone throws away is the Volksgarten, with its well-manicured botanical beauty. This park is famous for its rose garden with over 3,000 rose bushes that spring forth an impressionistic array of colours. You'll find that each rose bush there's a dedication to those beloved, clear sign that Vienna has its romantic side. We also went to the eastern side of the Innerstadt, in Stadtpark, a green oasis in historic Vienna, considered the oldest public park in the city, one that stretches over 28 acres of land. Here you'll find a great golden statue of one of Austria's greatest composers, the Waltz King, Johann Strauss. If you do want to elevate your park strolls to imperial level, well then, it has to be the Schönbrunn. Known for its imperial palace, Schönbrunn also boasts a magnificent park, one that's mostly open to the public. We came here for a good long stroll to experience this place from another perspective. 
There's still so much of Vienna I haven't seen. Sometimes I wonder how many visits, how many times I'd have to encounter the city to peel another leaf from its many sumptuous parts. Just a little walk around Vienna's Kringstrasse reminded me how truly stately and imperial this place is. First, there's the Austrian parliament, ceremonial and lofty in its classical Greek architectural forebears. Then next to it is Hathaus, the Viennese city hall, monumental in its neo-Gothic inspired edifice. Do inspect the Burg Theater across the road, a stentorian presence along this avenue. But the magnificence of Vienna isn't only seen from the exteriors. You'd have to go into a few such places to witness the remarkable collection of art and architectural jewels in the city. I've already witnessed a few, and this time I went to see the State Hall of the Austrian National Library, perhaps one of the most astounding libraries I've seen in this world. Talk about a pure Baroque splendor. This 18th century paradise of such aesthetic beauty. This beautiful library was ordered by Emperor Charles VI. The statue adorns the center of the hall, built with a great oval dome and painted with frescoes, a surely opulent way to house over 200,000 historical books. Next door, don't forget to visit the Augustiner Kirche, or Augustinian Church, with its unassuming facade that hides a great and long 300 years worth of history, being the official imperial church of the Habsburg monarchy, where some of history's royal weddings happened here. The weddings of Empress Maria Theresa, Empress Sisi to Emperor Franz Josef, the weddings of Napoleon Bonaparte, as well as Marie Antoinette to King Louis XVI of France. Lest we forget, Vienna is a museum city, and it holds a pride of offering many of the best museums in the world. This time, I've checked out Weltmuseum Vienna, or the World Museum, housed in the spectacular Neuburg wing of the Hofburg, at the residential wing of the Imperial Palace. This is one of Vienna's most fascinating museums, and Austria's largest anthropological museum, with exhibitions that take you into a journey around the world, across various cultures and ethnography. Another significant part of the museum is the historical collection of the Habsburgs' dynasty, from armory, objects and instruments that were part of the Austrian imperial family's life throughout the ages. One last museum I visited is the wonderful modern art collection by Rudolf and Elisabeth Leopold, both lovers and patrons of art. The Leopold Museum, famed for containing the world's largest collection of the works by expressionist artist Egon Schiele, this museum also features Gustav Klimt, specifically his later secessionist work, Death and Life. There's also Art Nouveau, Jugendstil, and Modernism, including collections of objects, paintings, jewelry, and furniture pieces that represent these art movements that will surely delight all art and design lovers out there. You know what else is beautiful in Vienna? The city's old town. Comprising of a few quarters, the Greek Quarter, the Jewish Quarter, and the Old University Quarter, where some of the cobblestone streets and buildings have been preserved since the Middle Ages. These are some of the most magical neighborhoods in Vienna, and walking around here is really quite atmospheric. Walk around Hochema, the oldest square in Vienna, and you'll find Anchor Clock, or Ankeru, a gilded Art Nouveau clock that depicts life at its many passing stages. A short walk from here is the Old University Quarter, where the Jesuit church is located, and it's worth a visit. A typically overlooked 17th century church with a high Baroque masterpiece of an interior, with spectacular paintings by Andrea Pozzo, especially the ceiling that's painted like a dome. Around the corner is Fleischmarkt, where the Greek Quarter is located, where you'll find the stunningly built Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church. But there's also something else special in this corner of Griechengasse. Here we stumble into a restaurant named Griechenbeisel, which happens to be Vienna's oldest tavern, founded in the 15th century. We learned that the likes of Mark Twain, Beethoven, Mozart, and even Pavarotti have all wined and dined here. So we couldn't help but satisfy our curiosity, as well as satiate our hunger, and went inside for a full-on lunch feast with a gloriously roasted Schweinhaxe or roast pork knuckle with hot and cold sauerkraut and pickles. We were stuffed, to say the least, but it must be said, I loved this restaurant and was very grateful for this real slice of old world Vienna that still exists today. 
Speaking of old world charm, one can't truly visit Vienna without stopping by at some of the coffee houses here. After all, coffee culture in Vienna is legendary. While I missed it during my last trip, I was finally able to visit the exquisite Café Sacha. Luckily, with a very little queue, we came here for breakfast and enjoyed none other than the original Sacha Torte, this classic Viennese chocolate cake with apricot jam recipe that was first created by the patissier Franz Sacha in this luxury hotel in 1832. As you can see, cafes here are no dreary business. The next one we visited is another Viennese institution, Café Landmann, serving elegance and coffee house style since 1873. The likes of Gustav Mahler, Sigmund Freud, Malena Dietrich had all frequented this café during their time in Vienna. We came here to indulge in long afternoon lunch with consomme soup and tartar beef, savouring some classic Viennese cuisine with Wiener schnitzel and veal scallops. And then, with a stroke of inevitability, we tucked in to the delectable house desserts. After this sumptuous time partaking in the coffee culture in Vienna, it was then time to take a Viennese experience to another level by going to the opera. It's another culture that's dearly valued and treasured in Vienna, and for a city with such celebrated and hallowed history of music and opera, they say to truly experience the city, a night at the glittering Viennese Staatsoper or the Viennese State Opera is a must. And that's exactly what we did, dedicating an evening to delight in the lush and gorgeous environment this Renaissance Revival building was the first major structure in the Hringstrasse. Built in 1869, this was considered the Vienna Court Opera and was unfortunately partly destroyed in the Second World War. However, much of the exterior, the main facade, the grand staircase and the Schwindfeuer all survived the destruction and are preserved until today. Which makes it even a better reason to celebrate the beauty and historic significance now considered one of the leading opera houses in the world. That evening, we witnessed a rapturous performance of Richard Wagner's magnum opus, Tristan und Isolde, and this opera evening was certainly a night to remember. There's another reason why I came back to Vienna, and it's something that's deeply embedded in the fabric of Viennese culture accompanying social life in the city like a good old friend. Wine. Wine in Vienna is essential, a staple, just like your quality pastry or coffee. Austrian wine, or in fact, Viennese wines, are so significant in this place that there's literally no other capital city in the world that sustains the largest growing and operating vineyards within its city boundaries. In other words, Vienna is a wine metropolis and you'll find sweeping vineyards along the hillsides in the outskirts of the city. That's why we partnered with City and Wine Tours to explore and experience the Wine Viertel wine region, located in north of Vienna, spending the day visiting three family-owned wineries, tasting local quality wines and getting to know the wine culture in the city as much as possible. We began our tour in the Schwarzburg Winery in Hagenbrunn, just about 30 minutes ride from the center of Vienna, tasting the wonderful organic wines of the cellar. We learned that the vineyards here are organically farmed, with the producers here believing in the philosophy that their organic wines authentically represent the terroir and the flavors of this region, resulting in a truly impressive portfolio of wines, featuring the classic grape varieties of Gruner Veltliner, perhaps Austria's most planted and most quintessential grape, and with Gelber Muscatella and Gemischte Satz, a popular field blend. We even got to taste the Sturm, that's grape juice in the process of fermentation, as a way to celebrate the year's harvest. Next up, we proceeded to visit the Holzer Winery in Liebendorf with the landscape of beautiful vineyards, with a view of the Krusenstein Castle. We had a joyful time sitting outdoors, surrounded by vines, sipping and tasting some of the Holzer family wines. From the refreshing Frisante to the typical wine fiesta classic, Grüner Veltliner, the Sauvignon Blanc, and this delightful red blend of Zweigelt, Merlot, and Syrah, a wine called Valentina, named after the couple Bernhard and Stephanie's daughter. Lastly, we finished off our evening with a visit at the Lima Winery, including a dinner at the Heuriger, a wine tavern, 
where the Viennese wine culture reaches their culmination, celebrating food and wine all together. We learn that Heudegger's, or wine taverns, were a result of a royal edict that allowed wineries to open their own doors during harvest season to serve their own food and wine, a historic tradition that has now grown as a part of a popular local culture. We loved this tour and thoroughly enjoyed tasting the refreshing, aromatic and crisp wines of this region, learning a lot about Austrian viticulture and ultimately celebrating a slice of a truly Viennese culture. Thank you, City and Wine Tours, for making this experience quite memorable. I never expected to come back to Vienna so soon, but life keeps surprising me at every turn, and it was really splendid to see Vienna from another perspective. One of the most standout moments during my stay here was a visit at Donauturm, or the Danube Tower, during sunset, as we went to the top admiring a glorious view of the city from the other side of the Danube, a side of Vienna that's rarely glimpsed by most visitors. I felt grateful to be here, seeing this view, seeing Vienna from a different angle, in a different light. It's moments like these that make me feel grateful for the gift of travel. To witness a city like Vienna that glides at its own pace, sings to its own tune, and waltzes to its own rhythm, a city that remains to be an ornate box of surprises, revealing nearly infinite amazement every visit. Come and think of it, we're so lucky to have a city like this, and for that we must treasure it. Not every lifetime we get to behold a city like Vienna. Want to be featured or create a video like this? or even sponsor a whole In The Mood episode. I now have openings for sponsorships, collaborations, and clients. Get in touch now and find out how we can work together. Email me, editor at jansandtoniago.com.